Good evening. Let's uh, start this evening's worship by singing hymn 15 out of the Spiral Bound Hymnal. 15. And we'll stand together. It is finished, Jesus cried. Then he bowed his head and died. Died for sins, but not his own. And redemption's work was done. Justice then was satisfied. God's elect are justified, righteousness our Lord brought in, and removed his people's sin. Sin and death and hell subdued by the power of Christ's blood, grace to sinners now is given pardon holiness and heaven it is finished can it be that Christ's blood was shed for me yes I know he died for me for by grace I now believe, pleading Christ's atoning blood, kneeling at the throne of God, gone my guilt, my sin is gone, it is finished, all is done. Be seated. No sweeter words to a believer's heart is finished. Everything that God requires, the Lord Jesus provides. <clears throat> Let's open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. And we'll begin reading at verse 1. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholdeth all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he saith, who maketh this angel spirit and his ministers a flame of fire? But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. It's the Father speaking to his Son, he calls him God. Thou hast loved righteousness 
and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That's a reference to the Holy Spirit, and we have a, an anointing of the Spirit of God in part. He had an anointing of the Holy Spirit in fullness. He was anointed with the oil of gladness above us. He's the Christ, the anointed one. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Let's pray. Our blessed Heavenly Father, thank you for the revelation that you have given to us of thy dear Son. Thank you, Lord, that, that you sent him into this world, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those of us who were cursed by the law. Lord, we rejoice in knowing that his work of redemption was successful, that he finished the work that you sent him to do, that he did it in the full power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that our ability to believe on him and rest in him and look to him and rejoice in him is the evidence that he did it for us. Lord, forgive us for our unbelief. We pray that for Christ's sake, Lord, that you would, that you would minister grace to our hearts and, and cause us to rest and rejoice once again in the accomplished work of thy dear son, the putting away of our sins and the establishment of a perfect righteousness before thee. Increase our faith. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand again. We'll sing hymn number 17 in the hardback hymnal. 17. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. From your mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise mine Ebenezer, hither by thy help I'm come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee. 
Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Be seated. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew 14. We're going to be looking at the same verses that we looked at last Wednesday night. I've titled this message, Christ, Our Righteousness. Our Righteousness. And he's all our righteousness. We have no righteousness outside of him. Verse 34 And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Last Wednesday night, we concentrated our thoughts on on the hem of his garment. And, uh, And I know I was encouraged to know that that a little with the Lord is much. And, um, that one drop of oil off of Aaron's robe would be sufficient, that one crumb from the master's table, that one word from the Lord would be sufficient to heal us. It just the, the, the way in which the Lord reveals the glory of Christ, that no flesh could glory in his presence, that he, that he demonstrates his glory um, Little by little, precept by precept, line by line, uh, growth in grace is, uh, is, is very gradual. We just sang. We're prone to wander. We wish we, wish we could, you know, we're oftentimes we're like a, you know, a, 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 a 12-year-old who wants to be 18, you know, just overnight. But it doesn't happen that way, does it? It doesn't happen that way. And uh, <clears throat> the pearl... The one pearl of great price the Lord Jesus reveals himself as and that all else is sold for for him. Let him who glory, glories glory in the Lord that no flesh should glory in his presence. Tonight I want us to, to look at the garment. We started with the hymn, but I want us to to think and and I trust rejoice in the significance of our Lord's garment, because surely it is a picture of of our covering and our righteousness before God. We see it all throughout the scriptures. <clears throat> Before we, before we even get into those, those scriptures, I, I, I want you to notice with me the posture that must be taken in order to touch the hem of the master's garment. Um, we know that that woman with an issue of blood uh, came crawling through the crowd, thinking if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And what did the Lord say? Virtue has gone out from me. And that word virtue is power. Uh, who touched me? Well, Lord, everybody's touching you. No, no. Somebody, not only in a posture, but in a spirit of grace and faith, has touched me. And, 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 and the woman came and told him all the truth. Um, she was unclean. 
she was supposed to identify herself as unclean and she hadn't done it. And uh, what, a, what a contrast here. We, we see in the Old Testament, there are several times in the Old Testament where the scripture speaks of someone who is unclean touching a person who is clean and that person who was clean now has become unclean because they've been touched by someone. And, uh, and that was the law. And what a contrast there is between law and grace. Because here we have a picture of one who is unclean touching one who is clean. And in rather making the one who is, unclean, who is clean unclean, he makes us clean. <laughs> Perfectly whole. Perfectly whole. Now, there was a time when we touched him and he was made unclean. And that was at the cross. Psalm 85 says that mercy and truth met together. Truth could not be sacrificed for mercy. God would be merciful but he would do it in such a way as to maintain his truth. And so mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. How could that be? God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we... We touched him with our sin on Calvary's cross and God imputed to him all the sins of all of God's people and he became, he became unclean and became the, the, the sacrifice for sin. But here, here we have the unclean touching the clean and being made clean. That's the touch of faith, brethren. That's how we come. We come knowing that there was a time when the, Lord, when the Lord bore our sins in his body upon that tree and put them away. And now, how many times we read in the Bible of, of individuals falling at the feet of the Lord Jesus? Here's the posture. We come to touch the hem of his garment. We've got to be down We've got to be down low. And it's a posture of worship and adoration. And we see it in many characters of the Bible. We saw it with Peter. We saw it with Mary. Uh, we, we, we saw it with Jairus. <laughs> right at the same time that that woman who had an issue of blood uh, came and touched the hem of his garment, Jairus comes and the scripture says he fell at the feet of the Lord. And that's how we come. We come in this posture of worship, not just in body, but more importantly, in spirit. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Look with me at verse 17. John has just seen the Lord Jesus in a way that no man's ever seen him before. And he describes what he saw in the previous verses. And uh, what a glorious manifestation of Christ that he was given, that he was given privilege to. And verse 17, it says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. The first thing the Lord speaks is don't be afraid. Yes, I'm God. (laughs) And yes, you are taking your proper place in bowing before me in worship. But you have no reason to be afraid. And he tells him why. Look at the next verse. I am he that liveth. And was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and hell. 
<laughs> I, and, 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 and what I open, no man can shut. So here's our hope that the Lord Jesus, when we come uh, prostrate before him, falling at his feet, touching the hem of his garment in faith, he says to us, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I died. And in my death, I put away your sin. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm alive now. <laughs> uh, the success of what I did in putting away your sin is evidenced by my resurrection. And our Lord is alive. Oh, you know, the, the gospel's good news, isn't it? It's, um, it, it's news, in order to be news, has to be fresh. It has to be alive. It has to be, has to be current. And, uh, and the word of God is called the living word. And, and it's because when the Lord gives us the grace to come and to touch the hem of his garment in faith and to, and to bow before him in worship, that he touches us and, and he speaks peace and hope and comfort to our hearts and gives us assurance that, that our sin's been put away, that there's no reason to fear him for wrath. It's the point is, that's the point here. We fear him in worship always, but we have no reason to fear the judgment of God. We have no reason to fear his wrath. That's been that Lord Jesus is called our propitiation. And so we have a write these things which you have seen and things which are and the things which are to be hereafter. Write them down, John. Here's the truth. This is our hope. And we come to the Lord based on what's been written. What's been written. Thomas, it's good that you've seen me and you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen me yet they believe based on what? Your testimony. Your testimony. The testimony of God's word, the living word of God. Oh, I hope that, you know, the difference between news and a documentary is that documentary just rehearses historical events. And, uh, and I, 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 have a, you know, I, I can do that. I can look back at historical events in the Bible and, and, and see them just as documentary facts. Oh, Lord, spare us. Spare us from that. Cause your word to be alive. Cause the gospel to be news to us. <laughs> Cause us to come fresh and bow and worship thee in spirit, in the power of your Holy Spirit and according to the truth of your word. That's how we come. And when we do, we are worshiping him as our righteousness, knowing that that's what this, that's what this garment is a picture of. As these, as these people were, we are diseased with sin. We're in need of a savior. We're in need of a substitute. We're in need of Christ to stand in our stead before God Almighty. And so we, we come before him, always dependent upon him for that end. And so <clears throat> this is what we, we, you and I are naked before God. <laughs> you know, th this, this matter of being, of having a robe of righteousness, which is what this clearly is a picture of, goes all the way back to the garden. The, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 2, the last verse of that chapter, that Adam and Eve were naked and they were not ashamed. They had no shame for their nakedness. And what happens as soon as, soon as they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened? Their eyes were open and they saw themselves as naked and they were afraid and they hid themselves among the trees and they sewed together fig leaves to try to cover their nakedness. That's there, there's, there's the result of sin. 
Sin brings, sin brings shame. And it, and, it, and it causes us to see something that, that, that we didn't see before. They, they, were, they were naked but not ashamed in the same way that a, a small child doesn't think about their nakedness. They've got no reason to be ashamed. But as soon as that innocence is taken away by sin... We say, with Adam, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. I was afraid. And the scripture says that the Lord clothed Adam with coats of skin. That's the same robe that we're looking at now. This robe is all the way through. We've got to have our nakedness covered. And the only way for us not to be afraid is to have our nakedness covered before God. And, and so we're, we're touching the hem of his righteousness, the hem of his garment, knowing that our righteousness is all of them are as filthy rags before God. We have, we have no, no righteousness. He is all of our righteousness. Adam actually said, because I was naked, I hid from thee. And God made him coats of skin and clothed them. I've heard, I've heard men question whether or not Adam was, was saved. Of course Adam was saved. The Lord covered him. <laughs> he covered his nakedness with a, with a fleece. I mean, it, we said, well, he, 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 he punished him by putting him out. No, that was mercy that God put him out of the garden. Because the scripture says that God set at the east gate of the garden cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the way, not to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they had eaten of and caused them to, to die, but to keep them from the tree, to guard the way to the tree of life. Had they remained in the garden in their fallen state, they would have never had the blessing of spiritual death, of, of physical death in order to be made alive spiritually. You see, that's why God, God put them out of the garden. And you and I have been, yes, we have the consequences of our sin. We we labor by the sweat of our brow and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the, the land produces thorns and thistles and, 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 and Eve is still uh, labors in childbearing and, and all those things that come as a result of sin. But physical death, brethren, for the child of God is not a curse. It's not a curse. The Lord Jesus was cursed in his death. And he died so that we don't have to die. He said to Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. See, Adam was put out of the garden so that, so that he could shed that body of flesh so that the corruptible could be made incorruptible, so that the mortal could be made immortal. And it all happened as a result of God clothing him with coats of skin. And so this, this need to touch the hem of the Lord's garment for the unclean to touch the one who is clean and to have him Make us, as, this, as our text says, perfectly whole. <laughs> perfectly whole. The spirit of just saints made perfect, the scripture says. Those are, that's talking about those who have gone to be with the Lord. That they've been made perfect. And that's our, that's our hope. That right now we're perfect in Christ by the imputation of his perfect righteousness, 
Abraham, Genesis, Romans chapter 4, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Um, and, and, and yet we look through a glass darkly now, but then face to face. Oh, no, what God did for Adam in the garden and putting him out of the garden was, was God's mercy. It wasn't judgment, it was salvation. <laughs> it was God providing for Adam so that he could experience the fullness of his righteousness. This, um, this word, this, this, this truth of the righteousness of Christ is seen in the covering that's spoken of in the Old Testament. That the ark was pitched within and without, and that word for pitched is the word covering. This, you see, we've got to be covered of our nakedness because of our fall in Adam, and here we come, and we touch the hem of his garment and he clothes us in his righteousness. When John gets to heaven, he sees the saints in glory and he says, who are these in white robes? And the Lord tells him, these are the ones who have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and they've been made perfectly white. Perfectly white. Here's where we're, we're coming to Christ for him. You know, I, I started to, I started to title this message "The Robe of Righteousness," but I changed it to "Christ Our Righteousness," <laughs> because that's what this robe represents. All the way back to that Lamb that was slain in the garden, all the way through to Revelation, the covering that we have before God is nothing, nothing other than the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our righteousness before God. In Jeremiah chapter 33, and she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. I love that, don't you? Don't you? That, that this imputation of righteousness is not just a, it's not just a theological thing. It's not just a, a doctrinal thing. It's not just a, a something. No, it's the person of Christ, the living son of God who gives to his people when they come before him, postured in worship, touching the hem of his garment, that they might be made whole. Falling at his feet, perfectly righteous before God. Genesis chapter 27. Rebecca is going to deceive her husband Isaac by making sure that the birthright that belonged to Esau was going to go to Jacob. And so what did Rebekah do? She put Esau's clothes on Jacob. And she took a, a, a fleece and put it on his arm because the scripture says that Esau was a hairy man and Jacob was not. And Jacob goes before his father, Isaac. And Isaac says, the smell is Esau. And the feel is Esau. But the voice is Jacob. Now putting all the issues of deception aside, we have a picture here of the Lord Jesus Christ. Providing for us. That's sweet. What is the smell a picture of in the Bible? It's a picture of prayers. Our prayers come up before him as a sweet smelling aroma. Is it our prayers that saves us? Is it our saying, Lord save me, that saves us? No, it was the Lord Jesus who prayed for us. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Father, I pray for them which thou hast given me. Peter, be of good cheer. I prayed for you. You're going to deny me, but I prayed for you. And so 
the, the, the smell coming before the Father. And when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. In other words, Lord, fix these prayers and make them right to the Father. My prayers are so feeble. You know, I'm like a, I'm like a, 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 a four-year-old out there in the yard gathering up flowers, you know, for, for, for my mother. And, and, and when she takes them, she doesn't just jam them in a, in a, in a base the way that you gave them to her. No, she arranges them and, and she displays them, but only after she's put her touch to them. And so it is with the Lord Jesus who has, who has taken our prayers and we pray them in faith. We pray them looking to Christ, looking to him for all of our righteousness. And Esau said, the smell, uh, Jacob, uh, uh, Isaac said, the smell is Esau. And the feel <laughs> is Esau. The voice is Jacob. Oh, uh, we come to him crying in our voice. But we're looking. We're looking in faith. And whatever's not a faith is sin. And so whatever we do, we're, 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 always, we're always looking to the Lord Jesus Christ for all of our righteousness before God. Lord, whatever, whatever you enable me to do in service to thee, it cannot be made acceptable because I did it. It can only be made acceptable in faith. And uh, what, a, what a perfect righteousness we have in Christ. That covering is all throughout the scripture. It's what the mercy seat was all about. When, when the priests would go into the holies of holies, Aaron would go in on the day of atonement and he would place the blood on the mercy seat and God said, here, I will meet with you. And that was called a covering. And the Lord said, when I see the blood, I'll pass by you. And... Scripture is very, very clear uh, about Aaron's robe. We saw last Wednesday night when Aaron was anointed that the oil went down his beard and down his robe and dripped off the hem of his garment. But on the hem of that garment, the Lord told Moses, when you make Aaron's robe, you put on the bottom of the garment, you put a pomegranate and a bell, a pomegranate and a bell, a pomegranate and a bell, all the way around the hem of that garment. And then when, uh, when the bride is praying in the Song of Solomon, she says uh, that I've brought my wine, my spiced wine, spiced with the sweetness of the pomegranate juice. What a, what a, what a beautiful picture of the, the, the bitterness that the Lord experienced when he drank that cup dry. He drank damnation dry. He drank the dregs of that, of that cup when he went to Calvary's cross. But as a result of that, we touched the hem of his garment and that wine is now sweet wine <laughs> it's mixed it, it's it's spiced wine with the pomegranate there we have a picture of the of the lord jesus who has who has sweetened our union with god so that the bitterness of god's wrath need not be experienced and the bells that were on his garment now there is a tradition it's not it's no place in scripture where they say that Aaron had a rope tied around his ankle and if they heard the bells uh, stop, they knew that he had done something wrong in the holies of holies and God had killed him. They could pull his body out without actually going in there. That's not in scripture. I don't know whether that happened or not. But I know that he had bells. And I know that those bells uh, told them where he was and what he was doing, and, uh, and, that, and that those bells rang success when he came out of the holies of holies, uh, that, that he made an atonement 
that the Lord was pleased with, that the Shekinah glory of God came down on that mercy seat while Aaron was in there. And the fact that the bells were still, were still ringing was the assurance that those people needed to know that, that God was pleased with the sacrifice that he made and he came out. That's the robe. That's the, all these pictures beginning with Adam and going all the way through to the book of Revelation. Here's why we come to Christ. Because apart from him, there's nothing but bitter dregs with God's wrath. Apart from his righteousness and he standing in my stead, I have no reason to believe that there would be any sweetness. But in Christ, in Christ, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I died and I forever live. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the righteous one. What a perfect, they were made perfectly righteous Here's this, this is the robe. And it's given to us over and over and over again in pictures and types all throughout the scripture. And the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, after he said, I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, I have come to fulfill it and accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not by any means enter into the kingdom of God. Now that would have been a shock to them because the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees as far as they were concerned was you couldn't exceed that righteousness. And then the Lord even made it more difficult when he said to them, you have heard by them of old He's talking about these scribes and Pharisees that, that thou shalt not commit murder. But I say unto thee, was the Lord bringing about a new law? No, this was always the law. You see, the scribes and Pharisees were focusing their righteousness on their outward behavior. And the Lord said, those scribes and Pharisees are telling you as long as you don't murder somebody, you're not guilty of murder. But my law has always been a matter of the heart. And I say unto you, if you have ought against your brother without a cause, you've already committed murder against him. Your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You heard them say that thou shalt not commit adultery. But that law went further than that. It always has been. And they may take pride in the fact that they think that they've, they've kept the law because they haven't done it. But I say unto thee, <laughs> and this is the way it's always been. I, the Lord wasn't changing the law. He, wasn't, he was interpreting the law. I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. I came to fulfill them. And accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I say unto you that if you Lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Man looks at the outward appearance. God's looking at the heart. Lord, how am I going to have that kind of righteousness? If you're, if you're able to see every thought and intention of my heart, Lord, how am I going to have a righteousness? Come like, this, like these people. Touch him. His righteousness comes from this robe. Lord, I need your righteousness. What power? All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. <laughs> oh, the Father has given him power to give his righteousness to as many as the Father has given to him. Lord, I've got to have a righteousness outside of myself. Turn with me to Revelation 7. I did a
poor job in quoting these verses a few minutes ago. Let's read them together. Revelation chapter 7. Verse 11, and all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and the four beasts, and, the, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God. It's not how we come. It's how we worship. Saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. So be it. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence come they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. And this is not you know, the dispensationalists will say, well, you know, at the end of time, there's going to be a great tribulation and you're going to have to die for the gospel in order to be saved after the rapture. No, this is not that. This is talking about where we are now. This is the, this is the world in which we live. In this world, you shall have great tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. This is, the, this is the shadow of the valley of death that believers have been walking through since the beginning of time. <laughs> and these are they which have come out of the great tribulation and they've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Lord, we're so prone to wander. Lord, we... We have no righteousness in ourselves. The only way that I'm going to have the righteousness of Christ is to have that robe washed in his blood, his covering. <laughs> That's what he said to John in chapter 1 that we've already read. Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the cause of your salvation. I'm the finish, the fulfillment of your salvation. I was dead, and now I'm alive. We look in faith to the successful sacrifice that the Lord Jesus made on Calvary's cross for our righteousness before God. We look in faith to him. Outside of him, we have none. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that you would speak hope and peace and grace to our hearts and reveal to us the glory of thy dear Son and give us faith to look and rest and believe on him. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 258, let's stand together. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand.
humble Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And numberless blessings each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine I sing in my rapture O glory to God for such a redeemer He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand when clothed in his brightness transported i rise to meet him in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand.